Today, we're going to be in the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Mark. We can continue our study of walking with Jesus. Sometimes walking with Jesus is incredibly dramatic and supernatural. And sometimes it's just everyday life. And you get to choose if you're going to walk with him or you're going to walk without him. He never leaves. He never forsakes you. But you can get way behind him. You can get way ahead of him. But you'll know when you're walking with him. Tuesday, I left the wonders of Colorado. The average highs in Estes Park were somewhere around 70, 72, 73 every day, which was perfect for me. It was hot and sun. It was cool in the shade. It was just glorious weather. Saw some fabulous, wonderful sights. I'd never seen bald eagles fishing. But the last day we were there, we were having lunch in a beautiful country clubhouse setting, looking out over the lake, perfect table next to the window. And Sherry said, that's a bald eagle. And I looked out and it was just soaring across the lake. And it circled, it came back around, it tightened its circles, it was looking down at the water. I'm sure it waited till the light was perfect and it dove. I mean, it just went into a straight dive into the water. There was a big splash. You see the eagle come up, he starts to flap, and he's got a big two handed fish that he just caught, and off he went. It was really nice when we were there, but reality kicked in. Had to get to the airport in Denver. Denver's under construction. It's a mess. It's slow. They said be here at least two hours early because of all the construction hazard. Got there, stood in a long, narrow line waiting for the TSA, my favorite, most brilliant people on the planet, dragging along. Got to the gate seven minutes before it started boarding had time just to scramble down the hallway to the bathroom and then board. And then we sat and we sat and we sat. So I could tell most of this crowd was not real happy about the wait, about the TSA, about having to get onto the plane. So when I was boarding, I thought I want to be nice to the flight attendants. They're probably about to have a rough time with an angry crowd of about 140 people on a 737 that was totally, completely full. So as I was entering the plane, nice lady, smiling, trying to be cheerful. Most people were just kind of giving her a look and moving on past. They didn't even acknowledge her presence. And I said, are we going to have snacks today? And she said, yes, the best around. I said, I can hardly wait. I've been looking forward to it all week. Just small talk and off I was going to my seat. Well, I sat in my aisle seat, which I was grateful for, flying southwest. Got in my aisle seat. There was another guy next to the window. We were both, we talked about, we were hoping for a very slender, beautiful lady to sit between us so we'd have plenty of room. We got a regular old guy, but he was not gargantuan. He was well-mannered. So we got seated. Well, when we get up to altitude, the lady comes down the aisle giving out snacks. She puts a snack down in front of me, serves other people, looks at me and smiles and says, I knew you wanted an extra. And she gave me a second snack. Well, you know, that made my day. I, I like food a lot. And then later she came back. She was taking drink orders. And I said, I think I'd like a seltzer water and some wild turkey in a bottle. Just leave it in the bottle. I know you have to take the lid off, but just leave it in the bottle. She said, don't pour it in the cell. No, no, no. Just leave it in the bottle. Because I thought, I'm going to work for about an hour on the flight, and then I'm going to take a nap, a nap. So I thought, a little bit of Wild Turkey 101 would put me to sleep pretty fast. When she came back and delivered it, I already had my credit card out. And she said to me, I already got your coupon. And I said, I'm so, and she said, I've already got your coupon. I said, well, thank you so very, very much. Well, that's just walking with Jesus. You know, as I was getting on, he said, just be nice to the people. Just make their day a little bit better. Well, it came back to bless me. I got double snacks and free alcohol. What more could you ask for? So life was good. Later, she came back picking up trash, and I tried to slip her a 20 and said, I found my coupon. Here it is. And she wouldn't take it. She said, oh, no, 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 no. Well, God said, make her take it. 
So when I was exiting the plan, I stopped and I said, I know you didn't want to take this, but God told me to give it to you. And he wanted me to tell you that he loves the way you treat people with your graciousness, your hospitality, and your love. And you make a bigger difference in people's lives than you're often aware of. Thank you so much. Put the money in your hand and was gone. It was quick. It had to be. People were trying to get off the plane. They were in a hurry. We sidestepped. But that's just what it's like walking with Jesus. You never know where he's going to go. You never know what he's going to do. He's never. You never know who he's going to have you interact with. But it gets to be fun after a while. Maybe not dramatic. Maybe not that big deal. That flight seemed to go faster than I've ever been. It was just, it was there and then it was gone. It went so quickly. That was just the Lord. So we're going to start the gospel of John today. John starts out, now this is, this is John the apostle who is writing about John the Baptist. And he starts out with Jesus. So we look at this, John the Baptist walked with Jesus for a very short time. Now they grew up together. They were cousins. But John the Baptist really didn't know who Jesus was until the Holy Spirit descended on him and John saw the Spirit of the Lord descend on him like a dove. And then he knew because God told him, I will show you, you will see my spirit land on the Messiah. And when that happened at his baptism, that was when John knew my cousin is the Messiah. And so we're looking at three days of how John the Baptist dealt with different groups of people and the things he said to them. But John the Apostle starts out by telling us who the Lord is. And I'm going to go a little bit slow and I'm going to read a lot because it's so important for you to realize who our God is, how powerful he is. We lose sight. You know, Jesus Christ has become a swear word. It's used casually, but it has deep, deep meaning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Let's think about that. You have become a child of God. You have access to the Father. Your Savior, your Messiah, is Jesus Christ. Everything that has been made was made by Him. He's the manufacturer. He's the author. He's the creator. There is absolutely nothing that he does not know, that he does not understand, that he does not have wisdom for. Anytime you've got a situation, a challenge, a struggle, a problem, and you tune into God, he knows exactly what the answers are. And we think, yeah, I know that. I know that. Heard it all my life. It's true. I believe it. Are you using it? Are you taking your problems to him? Are you asking him when you're dealing with difficult people, what's the solution here? What should I do? How should I deal with them? What should I do with my finances? 
Now, you probably got all that lined out. You got a plan, but it's always good to go back and ask him, am I doing the best thing that I can with my finances? I look back at my life and it's frightening having grown up in the church, learned to say mommy, daddy, and Jesus about the same time, made a commitment to full-time Christian service when I was a senior in high school, went to a Christian college. It's scary to me to look back and think how many times I did something because I thought it was a good idea. Didn't always work out so well. And I look back and think, you know, I jumped into it and asked God to bless it. And he's always been gracious. However, I could have avoided a lot of detours, a lot of heartache, a lot of hard times, a lot of mistakes, a lot of losses if I'd stayed closer and walked with Jesus and really ask him about everything. Because he knows. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So I read on verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now think about that. Jesus came with grace and truth. I think of grace as unmerited favor, things we haven't earned, things we don't deserve, things that we like to have, and God gives us that grace. What are things that are just out of your reach that God just might like to give to you if you would let him? Most of us get set in places where we just think, I'm lucky to have what I have. Jesus came that you would have life and have it abundantly. That's where grace comes in. And he is of grace and truth. Think about the areas of your life where you don't feel the freedom you'd like to feel. Get something in mind. Because Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So he's got this grace and truth. It's up to you to access it, to ask for it. You don't have because you don't ask to seek this. And when you do, you'll see him begin to move. So John is describing him. He helps explain how it works. Three things happened. We're going to look at three days in the life of John the Baptist. One of those days, he basically was talking to the crowd that had gone out in the wilderness in the desert to follow him. And he said, he is here. Well, there were questions about that. Verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight way the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. 
These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So we've got this first day where his people are there and he's just telling them he is here. And then he's going to tell them to look at him. And then he's going to tell them on the third day, follow him. So he's got these three days. Well, the Pharisees had come to ask him questions. They were sent by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, which is national headquarters. And the Sanhedrin was kind of like Congress. You know, we've got Democrats and Republicans. It goes back and forth, back and forth, whoever's got the majority. The majority of the people in the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. They were the liberals of their day. They did not believe in miracles. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't care all that much about scripture. The Pharisees were the conservative fundamentalists who were all about the scripture and the law and the word of God. And then there were the scribes that were the secretaries who took all the notes and the minutes and followed them around and helped them do what they did. So these people came to check him out He denied being the Christ or the prophet or the one they were looking for. He was pointing to Jesus the whole time. That was his ministry. So they come on one day. He says, he's here. He is here. The Messiah is here. And then the next day, he talked to him and he said, look at him. And then the last day, he said, follow him. So in verse 29, The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Can you imagine what it's like to be John? Jesus was his cousin. Those boys grew up together. Jesus was probably kind of quiet, kind of obscure, hang out, hung out in the carpenter shop, except the one time when he was 12, he got in trouble for going to the temple and getting separated from his parents for about three days. They were worried, scared to death. And he said, where have you been? He said, (laughs) been about my father's business. Imagine that at 12. I would pay money to see him bewilder the elders. These are the smartest guys, the most educated, the most religious guys on the planet at the time, and he bewildered them. I'm not sure, but I bet he asked them questions they could not or did not want to answer. He probably had a great time with them. But they grow up together, and now Jesus is 30. John has been on his own mission. He obeyed God. He went to the wilderness to preach repentance and water baptism. Jesus shows up, and he sees the Spirit of God descend and remain on Jesus. And he knew, oh, my gosh, my cousin is the Messiah. That's got to that gotta make a difference. So we look what John did. It was a short walk with Jesus. We're going to look at several benefits you will have today when you walk with Jesus. Like you see with John, you get to see God move. Because John was walking with Jesus, and God knew he would be. God told him how to recognize the Messiah. So God gave him inside information. He was waiting for it. He was looking for it. And when it happened, he realized, oh, my goodness, God told me something, and it came to pass. That will build your faith. It really will. Last week, we had somebody share a prophetic word for the first time ever. Let me tell you, it's scary stuff. Stand up in front of a bunch of people, 
and say, I think God had something for somebody here, it can be scary. In time, you get used to it and you come to know there's a difference between my thoughts and God's thoughts. And you can separate them. This is why Hebrews 4.12 is so significant. The word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing, separating soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And that's one of those passages for several decades. I thought, that's weird. But look at it. Written about 2,000 years ago. Do you know how many people are alive today because we finally learned how to separate bone and marrow? There are a lot of people walking this planet today alive because of a bone marrow transplant. It was separated from the bone and they got the marrow and it changed and saved their lives. Well, why in the world would you ever need to divide soul and spirit? So you'll know who's inside your head. Is this my crazy imagination? Is this my thought? Is this my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions? Or is this spirit? Is this God's spirit? Is this my human spirit? Is this an evil spirit? That's why you need to know the word of God. It's going to help you to determine and divide soul from spirit. You need to do that with other people. Is that their soul? Is that their good idea, their good intentions, their good feelings for you? Or is that the spirit of God speaking through them? It's so important to separate the two. You see, John was able to do this as he walked with Jesus. Verse 35, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? There's two benefits. When you walk with Jesus, he will see you. As a counselor for the last 38 years, I've talked to a lot of people who go through their life and they just hurt because they don't feel like their parents really saw them or their brothers and sisters didn't see them or people at their church don't see them or people at work don't really see them, don't really understand them. When you walk with Jesus, he will see you. He will know you. It's so important. We all as human beings desperately need to feel understood. And so many people go through life without feeling understood. That's one of the benefits of walking with Jesus. He will see you absolutely perfectly. will always know more about you than you even know about yourself. And he will help you. He is a really good spiritual director. My first doctorate was in spiritual direction. I'd never heard of it. And the first time I heard about it, I knew that's the degree I need to get. So I went after it. Spiritual direction was taking someone's own spiritual experience and helping them understand it and expand it. So many people have more spiritual experiences than they realize. Jesus is the ultimate spiritual director. He can really help you understand how he deals with you, how. He speaks to you. He speaks to some people with pictures. He speaks to some people with auditory things. They'll, they'll hear voices in their head, sometimes audible voices. Other people, they'll get feelings. I've got several friends that are empaths. They feel other people's feelings. It sounds kind of neat. It's really difficult. One friend who often comes to this Bible study is a crazy gifted empath. And we thought she was just crazy. For years, her family thought she was crazy. Her church staff thought she was crazy. And we finally figured out she feels other people's feelings. And sometimes she would be carrying the feelings of about five different pastors. And it was overwhelming. And she lived in a state of severe overwhelm until we realized. And then several of we pastors who knew each other would have 
messages from her. It's like, hey, are you okay? And she was learning to figure out what was my feeling and what was somebody else's feeling and what was her feeling. Very useful in counseling sessions. She often sits in with me when I'm meeting with ladies and she can tell them how they feel. That gets their attention. She just knows. So that's one of the things that happens when you walk with Jesus. You get insight. He helps you separate soul and spirit. He does things like this. Something I I want you to realize here, too, is John the Baptist had disciples. He had followers. More than likely, they supported him. They would give him food. They'd do things because he was doing God's work. He was quick to release them. We've got a quick overview that John recorded that's going to last forever and ever. He didn't write down everything that happened. But I have a feeling it's like, guys, behold, that is the Lamb of God. What are you doing with me? Follow him. He instantly gave them away. He realized, I've brought them as far as they could go. This is going to happen in your life. God is going to bring people into your life who will teach you, who will help you, who will educate you, who will take you from this point to the next point. Doesn't mean you're supposed to stay with them forever. You know, I've been teaching Bible studies since, gosh, there, there are remnants that remain here that goes back to 1997 when I started teaching a weekly ladies Bible study at the Stanzel's house. That's quite a while ago. And people come and go, and that's fine. In fact, I made a decision <coughs> when I started the men's group about seven years after the ladies group had started. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to try to impress these guys with something new, something they've never, ever heard before every week, which is possible, or am I just going to go back to the basics and just hammer away at the basics? And I chose to go for the basics. I'd rather you really learn something well and move on than just entertain you for the next 20 or 30 years. Once you've had enough of me and you've got it and you're practicing it and it's working for you, find somebody else because other people have things different from me. You're going to find God is going to bring people into and out of your lives because he's always trying to move you forward because God always has your highest good in mind. I got to stop here because a lot of people in the church today believe it's totally, completely about selfish obedience. They've ra- they've been raised with an egomaniac sitting on his throne who wants you to obey. Did you ever have times with your parents when you had needled them and questioned them and badgered them and they finally would stop giving you good answers that because I said so. I heard that a lot. I'm sure I deserved it. I wore my parents out. I had endless questions. I was a curious kind of kid. And I really questioned their decisions all the time. They didn't give me as much freedom as I deserve at three and four and five, six years old. And then as a teenager and then in my 20s. So I constantly harassed them. God is not egotistical. He does not have a human ego. The reason he tells us how to live in scriptures and gives us this big, thick book that took about 1,600 years to put together that's going to last forever and ever, he gave this to us because he invented us. He knows what works. He knows what doesn't work. He says, hey, guys, here are the guidelines. Follow it. It will make your life better. I've also given you free will. If you don't believe me, fine. Knock yourself out. Test it. See if I'm right or wrong. He gives us lots of options. But it's because of his love that he tells us how to live. You know, I've disobeyed many times, still do it every day. When you think about how God teaches us to think and you think about the average person thinks 60 to 80,000 thoughts a, a day. That's a lot of thoughts. 
are they all conforming to Philippians 4, 8? Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. But we go negative. We go dark. He tells us to fear not. This morning, early in the morning, I was just skimming headlines and noticed that there's another COVID-19 brand new China virus coming our way this fall. But they're going to have a new vaccine that you can get if they have it done on time. And they're hoping that everybody who get vaccinated will have the vaccine on time before the winter cold sets in and it really runs rampant and it can kill more and more and more and more and more people. It's amazing how they publish it's still killing hundreds of thousands of American citizens. But have you noticed the regular flu just vanished? It's not around anymore. It's not killing anybody. It ceased to exist. We only have COVID-19. And there are a whole lot of people who have died with COVID, but not because of it. So I'm not sure we're always getting accurate information, but I just decided after about five seconds of thinking about that, I don't care. I'm not going to worry. I've lived through the pandemic. I've had it twice. It was the best flu I ever had. I'm serious. First time, it took me out for four days. I slept about 20 to 22 hours. I was weak. I had fever over 103. Four days, I rested, I slept, and it was gone. Got it last summer on sabbatical, of all things. Stayed in bed for about another four or five days, high fever. It went away. I didn't have the sore throat. I didn't have the achy body. I just got to sleep nearly all the time. Bring it again. I like that one better than the old-fashioned flu. I'm dead serious. I really am. Or I'm alive serious, however I should say that. So we look at this, and we find John stepping up, gathering people. But then when he recognizes that's the Messiah, he says, guys, it's time to leave me. Follow him. And they started walking with Jesus. The next day, again, John was standing with his two disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed there with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, and you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Look at the benefits of following Jesus. He saw them like they'd never seen before. He saw everybody this way. He sees you this way. If you're still trying to figure out what you're going to be when you grow up, you're still trying to figure out what you should do with your life, he knows better than you. He sees you. He knows your strengths and weaknesses. He's got a place for you, and he's always trying to get you to whatever is for your highest good. Keep in mind, remember, God is the all-sufficient one. He doesn't need anything. This sounds like blasphemy. He doesn't need your praise and your worship. He doesn't need your love. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your service. But he suggests all those things because they're good for you. They will make you feel better. They'll make your life go better. He's constantly trying to help you understand how this life works and how to make it work better for you. And he's constantly trying to position you. Some of you are in a tough place. Some of you got some big decisions to make and you're not sure what to do. He knows. 
and he's trying to move you toward what is best for you next. As soon as you're ready, you're really not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. He's never been late. We're usually late when it comes to spiritual things. So you can catch up with him and he will help you. He will guide you. He'll direct you. It's like he said, hey, this is who you are. They had not visited. Jesus hadn't done a background study. He said, this is who you are. You're Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, which means rock. Then he does it again. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law. And also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. So immediately he pointed out that Nathanael was somebody that just didn't have any deceit in him. Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That probably was a statement of humility because he was from that region himself. He's thinking, how could the Messiah come from where I came from? But he did. But Jesus recognized him. So when you walk with Jesus, when you follow Jesus, when you let him lead you and guide you, he's going to see you. He's going to teach you and tell you and show you who you are and lead you to where your most fulfilling life will be. These four guys, Andrew, Peter, James, John, throw Nathaniel in there and Philip. The first four were fishermen. They were in a family business. They probably planned to fish the Sea of Galilee for the rest of their lives. It was a good business. They were making a good living. They were busy. They were exporting a lot of fish. They were making a living for themselves. It was pretty good-sized business, according to the scholars. But they walked away from it to follow Jesus. And what did he do? He made them fishers of men. He made them from mere fishers in Galilee to people who would change the world forever, who would do supernatural things, who would know God well, even though all but one of them were martyred. It was the best life for them, more than they could ask or imagine. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how many mistakes you have made. Doesn't matter how many times you've given up. God always has something better for you because he loves you so much. Our God is a dynamic God. He always has something better. It's so easy to think, oh, I'll never find another girlfriend. I'll never find another boyfriend. I'll never find a husband. I'll never find a wife. I'll never find anybody as good as I used to have. I'll never have a job as good as the one I lost. We think in terms of that. I'll never find another restaurant as good as the one that I love that just closed down. God does not ever run out of better things. And he's trying to lead you to them as you walk with him. We go to Mark now. We see more benefits. We'll pick up in verse 29 of Mark 1. This is kind of where we left off last time. And immediately, Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately told, told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. This happens when you walk with Jesus. He will go where you have needs, where you have concerns, and he will address them. We look at this. This was Simon's mother-in-law. He is about to leave his family because he was married. That's how he had a mother-in-law. He's married. 
He's about to leave his wife and he's concerned for his mother's health. So Jesus just heals her and off they go. Then we get down to verse 35. One of the things that happens is Jesus models his spirituality for us. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. I thought it was interesting. The Holy Spirit just highlighted that for me. He went to a desolate place. Ever find yourself in a desolate place? Your home can be a wonderful place and it can quickly become a desolate place. Your body can become a great body that feels good most of the time, has lots of joys and pleasures, and it can become a desolate place. Jesus went to the desolate place to pray, to be along with God, to connect. He modeled true spirituality. He spent time with God. He put God first. He knew where he was going that day. He knew what he was going to have to do. And he wanted to see what God was doing. He wanted to hear what God was saying. So he started there. Keep in mind, he never, ever did anything that he did not see the Father doing. He never said anything that he didn't hear the Father saying. When you walk with him, he'll model that for you. He'll show you what it looks like. He will help you. He will give you favor with people you're supposed to have favor with. He'll put words in your mouth just as he did with Jesus. God will do for you. Chapter two. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit, that they thus questioned within themselves and said, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Two more things I'd like to address with you today. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. God responds to your faith. This friend was healed because of the faith of his friends that were willing. He put him on a pallet. Each one of them was carrying a fourth of his body weight. That's probably a load. They took him. They went out of their way. They couldn't get in. They wouldn't give up. They climbed up on the roof. They tore the roof up. They lowered him right smack dab in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw their faith and heal their friend. He still is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will do things for your friends, for the people you care about because of your faith. Didn't say anything about the faith of the paralytic. It was the faith of the four friends. So you have great power because God acknowledges faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists. In fact, it starts out, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. You got rewards coming when you have faith. He rewards people. You can't please him without faith. I was thinking, okay, what am I doing for faith? Well, it was faith to share a prophetic word with a total stranger on the plane, but that was not a big deal. That was not a challenge. And if it didn't go well, I was leaving anyway, never see her again in my life. No real loss there. But then I'm thinking, I am so sick and tired of owning a home and fixing the air conditioner and taking care of the yard and repairing the sprinkler system and the outdoor lighting and dealing with it. I'm just tired of taking care of a house. So I've been thinking about a high rise, but that's going to be a monthly payment. The house is paid for. That's faith. So I'm praying through that, trying to figure out, God, you want me to take that leap of faith? But if it is faith and it's what he's leading me to do, it will work out and he will reward me for having the faith to lessen my load so more of my time and energy can go to things that I enjoy and are a whole lot more important than me taking care of that house. So we'll see how that works out. Another thing we see here that's so important, when you walk with Jesus, he's going to help you deal with people. This is what he models for us. This is more of his spirituality. Verse 8, chapter 2. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Folks, you can do stuff like that. Most of us live through our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotions. As you sit here right now, everyone in this room has mastered their bodies. You can type, you can fan, you can flip pages in the Bible. You can do all kinds of things with your body. You've mastered your mind. You can think of anything on demand just like that instantaneously. You can think of, of things. If I ask you to picture a moving van, boom, you can do it. Let it turn into a great big, huge pink elephant. You can do that instantaneously. You get your body to move. You can get your mind to think. Well, what about your spirits? You've mastered your soul. You've mastered your bodies. Your spirit has those three functions. It's your communion with God. It's your conscience. And it's your intuition. I would define intuition as when you know things that do not come to you through your five senses. He knew these things through his spirit. He knew what they were thinking in their hearts because he had a well-trained spirit. I've seen people minister. I've seen people do amazing things. I so appreciate the story of T.D. Jakes. He had a very big, happy, healthy church in the east part of the country. And God just told him in his spirit, move to Dallas and start something. Now, that's... That's an act of faith. If some big church here said, oh, Bishop Jakes, we want you to come to Dallas. We've got a $300,000 a year salary for you. We've got a mansion on White Rock Lake that will help you buy at a really good discount. We've got a wonderful retirement. We've got thousands of people. We'd love for you to come. That would still take faith because it's unknown. But to leave something to go to nothing other than what God has told you to do is a big step of faith. And man, has his ministry ever exploded because he had faith, he believed God, and he believed that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. That was something that came to him in his spirit. It wasn't just an idea he thought of. It was his spirit at work in him. So we see these benefits of following God. Jesus. I'll wrap it up with this. 16 years ago, my beloved girlfriend, Sherry, we've been together for about 17 years, was looking for a change in her life. 
She was a catastrophe adjuster for all state. When Hurricane Katrina hit, she was there for nine months. Now she's, she's tiny, she's little. Ranges from about 102 to 106 pounds, five, three and a half. She was in the ninth ward, a rough part of New Orleans for nine months as an adjuster. They declared martial law. You couldn't go in there unless you had permits. She'd stand on rooftops and look in 360 degrees, not see another living human being. The chickens would chase her. They were so happy to see a living human being. They hadn't found all the bodies in the houses yet. She would go down in basements that had two or three feet of water in them and snakes in there because it was part of her job. She was making great money. She was really helping people who were all in desperate need. She was giving them money. She was helping them put their lives back together, working about 18 hours or more a day, seven days a week, month after month after month. She enjoyed that. She was really good at it. But she said, God, I'd just like to do something artistic. I'd like to do something creative. And she said, I... I'll just take whatever you give me. I'd love to be on the radio. If my music ever gets published, she'll wake up in the morning. She's got about 60 songs that she just wakes up with and they're there. Lyrics and melodies. It's a gift from God. She thought, I'd love to be in the radio. I'd love to write books and be in the bookstore. I'd love to do screenplays and be in the theaters. Or I'd love to be in the art gallery. Just anything creative, anything artistic. And God started moving. And she talked to her son one day and he said, hey, mom, do you remember so-and-so who had a band in high school? And it's like, yeah, nice kid. Well, he's got a band. He lives in Boulder. He's looking for a songwriter for his band. They're great musicians, but they don't write music. Would you like to talk with him? She said, love to. She went to Boulder. She had a great meeting. They liked her. They liked her music. It looked like this could be it. There's real potential. On that trip, God told her, go to Aspen. She'd never been to Aspen before. So in faith, she drives to Aspen. On the drive toward there, she kind of had an out-of-body experience on the freeway, going about 70 or 80 miles an hour. And you know you've had one of those when suddenly you're back driving the car and you don't know where you've been. But while she was kind of in another place, God said something very significant is going to happen for you in Aspen. She got there, parked the car, started walking. It's a great walking village, beautiful, beautiful place. And she's gone from store to store and gallery to gallery. She's in one gallery. She gets to talking to the salesman there. He finds out she likes to paint. He said, well, let me see your work. She said, I'm from Dallas. I didn't bring it with me. And he said, well, you got any pictures? Well, on my laptop, but it's in the car. We'll go to your car, get your laptop. I mean, he's a pushy kind of guy. And so she went, she got her laptop, she came back in, showed him some of her work. He said, I'd like to represent you. And she said, well, what would you want me to paint? He said, aspen trees and horses. Okay. So she came home, she painted some aspen trees and some horses and shipped them to him. They sold. She was in business. She was suddenly a professional artist in a high-end gallery in Aspen. And, you know, people who go to Aspen and stay there for a while, it's no big deal to buy a painting for twenty dollars or $30,000, a little souvenir. Since we're in Aspen, we want to remember this vacation we had. Let's, let's buy that huge picture of Aspen trees. So she did that. About six months later, he called and he said, I'm leaving the gallery. I'm going to open my own. Would you go with me? She said, sure. He got aspenartgallery.com. Pretty cool. Most people would say that's impossible. It's been taken for a long time. He got it. Don't know how. And he was in business. She's been one of his best sellers for the last 16 years. Catastrophe adjuster to oil painter. There's nothing. God can't do. He didn't need anything from you, but he would love for you to have a great life. He would love to bless you. 
He would love to position you. He would love to get you in the best place, live in the best way so that you can fully enjoy the abundant life that he paid so much for you to have.